Our scripture reading this morning is uh, Colossians 3, 12 through 17, and I'll be reading from the New International Version. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Thanks, Jack. Just three items before we get into the discussion of the text that Jack just read for us this morning. First of all, in regard to Mission Forum Sunday last week, thank you again for your commitment and your generosity. Uh, that you showed and shared with the uh, contributions and the commitments, the pledges that you made for the coming year. If you noticed in the uh, bulletin article, we reached just last Sunday 93% of what we needed for Mission Forum. And so uh, we're hopeful, uh, in fact, we're expectant that uh, through additional gifts from those who weren't able to be here last week, uh, for those who may not even be here today, uh, that we will not only reach but surpass that goal. If you weren't here last week, you can find one of these purpose cards on the shelves right at the, the back doors. Uh, you can take that, fill that out, indicate what you're able to give now, what you're able to give in the coming year, pass this along to one of the elders. And a reminder, especially to our new members, if you haven't been through the drill before, these little envelopes that you'll find in, in the back of the pew in front of you, uh, you can put your mission forum contributions if you're making weekly or monthly in the coming year. However you want to do that, put these, uh, your contributions in this little envelope, put it in the contribution plate, and that'll help the brothers separate out the uh, regular contribution each week from our, our special mission forum contribution. We do have a blood drive going on today over in the outreach center. In fact, they're probably already set up over there. And so if you're able to assist with that much needed ministry, uh, even if it means bailing out on my sermon, I, I will send someone to follow you uh, to make sure you're going to give blood. But, you know, if you want to do that during the remainder of the service, if you want to do that during Bible class, if you want to stick around afterwards, and some of you may be wondering, you know, why would we schedule that concurrently? Simply because this is when we're here. It's easier to get you now than to have you come back at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock this afternoon. And there were some people in the days of Jesus who wondered if it was lawful to do something good like that for them on the Sabbath day and in the synagogue. Mark chapter 3, there's a woman with a withered hand. And people are wondering, what is Jesus going to do? Is he going to heal this woman? Is, is he going to do good? Is he going to bless her health and her life in this setting of the synagogue? when they need to be focused on, on worshiping God. So Jesus asked them a question. Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath day? Uh, is it lawful to uh, save a life or to kill on the Sabbath day? Luke chapter 13, a similar instance. They're, they're, he knows that they're thinking in their mind, you know, there, there's six days, Jesus, when you could heal this woman who's been bent double for 18 years. Uh, you need to heal her sometimes Sunday through, through Friday. You don't need to do that on Saturday. And maybe some of you are thinking, well, you know, you got Monday through Saturday to give blood. Well, why not now? You know, we're able to do something today. I don't know, you know, the priest and the Levite probably thought they had something more important to do for God than to stop and help a man who was beaten and left for dead. Uh, we get to prepare those bandages and that oil and wine ahead of time. Uh, for the benefit of somebody who's going to be in need. So save a life today. Uh, do good in that way, and I think God will be very pleased. I think he will be extremely glorified and honored by that. Uh, fall Festival, coming up two weeks from today. Uh, even though that's a fourth Sunday, the 27th, uh, it's going to be a fifth Sunday for us in regard to the fact that we're going to have a fellowship lunch together. 
Uh, we're going to have a devotional over in the OC. And then from 5 to 7, out here in the North parking lot, we're going to have an activity that in the past several years has drawn an incredible number of our neighbors uh, from our immediate community. Uh, we're able to feed them with the big grill and, and hot dogs, uh, got candy and trunk or treat, we've got games set up, but that takes a lot of volunteers to take care of. And so there are sign-up lists in the foyer. Karen, are they over here in the youth corner? In the middle? Okay, all right, sorry, I couldn't understand you. Uh, right in the middle. There are some uh, sign-up lists, and we need youth volunteers. We need adult volunteers as well to help keep these games running during that time. I don't know how many people from the neighborhood I met uh, last, last fall when we had this uh, event. We've also uh, got, uh, some of you know that Coleman's gotten hooked in with uh, Gatesway Foundation over here on College Street, kind of supplementing what he's doing in the afternoons. This is last year of school and uh, they're gonna bring some people over, some of their residents that, that live there. They don't get out very much, and they're always looking for something close, something that the uh, residents there would enjoy. So be looking for them as well and welcome them, and we're gonna be able to bless them in return with some of the decorations and things that we have here. All right, thank you for giving your attention to the Mission Forum contributions and the Blood Drive and, and Fall Festival, and now we'll get into our discussion of the text this morning. Uh, how do you convince someone, and these are, this is an abbreviated form this morning of some thoughts I was able to share down at Oklahoma Christian uh, in the early part of last week, and so there are three people in this assembly who can check out mentally. That's uh, Jake Parker and Abby Hudkins and Zach Buckmaster. Uh, you guys have heard a lot of this before. I gave them a heads up, you know, that if they wanted to give blood or if, uh, if they wanted to take notes or do something else, during the sermon time they could. They were kind enough to, to come to the uh, presentation that I made down there this past week. But if you're trying to convince someone of how special they are, and if you're wanting to persuade them of the value that they have as a select person, as a chosen person, if you're wanting them, them to realize what a blessed and favored status they have, how can you do that without fueling their pride? How can you get them to buy into those concepts without them getting all self-righteous about it? Without them thinking about this is all about position, this is all about privilege. Uh, how do you do that without creating a class of self-righteous snobs? If you're able to convince them of these things. So in other words, how do you confer honor without creating hubris? And somebody says, what's hubris? Well, that's pride. That's arrogance. Well, Tim, why didn't you just say pride or arrogance? Because they don't start with an H. Okay? They don't start with an H. Um, so how do you confer this kind of honor? How do you convince people of these things without engendering in their minds this over-self-confidence? and this pride and this arrogance. And I think in the text of the entire letter of Colossians, that's one of the things that Paul is striving to do. If you know something about the background of the epistle to the Christians in Colossae, you know that they're being pulled in a lot of different directions. Yes, they found salvation in Christ, but a lot of people are thinking, well, that's all well, fine, and good. What else is there? You know, they were happy to be in Jesus Christ, but isn't there more? Can't we find something else? And so in answering a lot of what's going on in Colossae, Paul wants to convince them that they are not only blessed, they are incomparably blessed in Jesus Christ. In Him is the fullness of God's blessings without exception. And that in Christ, in Christ alone, are found these blessings. Uh, if you go back to chapter 2, verse 12, this is the same Jesus uh, with whom they had been buried in baptism, the same Jesus with whom they had been raised through faith in the working of God. And so why look for anything else? There's no need to seek a greater sense of identity or a higher standing of position. And I wish we had time this morning to look at some of these other verses in Colossians where he identifies some of these things that they were being sold, that they were being told, you've got to buy into this if you really want to be complete if you want to be really spiritual. For some people, it was Jewish legalism. 
holding on to aspects of the law, binding those aspects of the law on people. For other Christians in Colossae, it was buying into Greek philosophy. For other people, it was Eastern mysticism. You know, you, you got to be a part of this elite group uh, that really understands what spirituality is all about. For other Christians in Colossae, they thought the extra step was this severe and extreme asceticism, uh, punishing the body. The more miserable you can make the flesh, they thought, uh, the more enriched your spirit is going to be. For others of them, it was devotion to angels. He has to address this problem. Back in chapter 2, people who were worshiping angels because that they thought that was what was extra or what was needed. Uh, but basically, Paul is saying that any philosophical move away from Christ and Christ alone is trading down. doesn't matter what it is. If you think you need something else besides Jesus and Jesus alone, you're trading down. Which is another way of saying you're on the mountaintop with Jesus. Why would you want to trade or barter for spiritual swampland? Everything besides Christ and Christ alone is spiritual swampland. So how can he convince them of their all-sufficient specialness as God's chosen people without forming this band of self-absorbed elitists, but rather inspire them to be a committed community of, of humble servants? Uh, that's not really easily done. That's not an easy balance to strike. It's not an easy balance to maintain. Uh, it wasn't then. It, it isn't now. So in this text, particularly that we're looking at today from chapter 3, He's challenging them to consider not only what it means to be a chosen people of God, but to live as a chosen people of God. The more immediate context starts in the first three verses of Colossians 3. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, chapter 2, verse 12, you were buried with Him. Now you've been raised up with Him. If you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You were a dead man walking, and now you've been made alive in Jesus Christ. You've received a heart transplant. You've got a new heart. You've got a new ID. And particularly in verses 3 through 8, <clears throat> specifically in verse 5 uh, and verse 8, we have two lists of five moral vices. Uh, in verse 5, it's immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed. In verse 8, it's anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech. And these vices are to be overturned into virtues, the five that we find in verse 12. Uh, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So there's been a reversal a moral reversal that's based on a reversal of identification. They used to be children of disobedience. Now, they are chosen and holy and beloved of God. And that's what we want to focus on this morning, what it means to be a chosen, holy, and beloved people. If you have an older English translation, the King James Version, for instance, uh, you won't see chosen of God here. You'll see elect of God. And the, the phrase here, eklektoi tutho, just means uh, chosen of God, elected by God, selected by God, picked by God. And there is a great sense of value and importance and acceptance that comes from being chosen. Uh, for those of you who are married, uh, out of 7.1 billion people upon the face of the earth, your spouse chose you to marry. Out of 7.1 billion people, what on earth were they thinking when they picked you? They had 7.1 billion other people to select from. They, they picked you. Well, you know why they picked you, because they loved you. Uh, that makes you feel valued. That makes you feel special. Uh, going back to our school days on, on the playground or at recess, you know, a couple of captains were appointed and teams were selected. If you were a high first round draft pick out on the playground, uh, that gave you a real sense of value, uh, a real sense of importance. We have been chosen by God. We are holy. 
that is set apart, separated, consecrated for God's special purposes. We are loved by Him. And when you look at all three of these, many of you will think of the status that Old Testament physical Israel had. They were a chosen, holy, and beloved people. A chosen race, a holy nation. And so this confirms that we are in Christ what they were under Moses and under Abraham as that special people of God, except now it doesn't matter whether or not you're a Jew or a Gentile. It doesn't matter if you're uh, slave or free, circumcised or uncircumcised, Scythian, barbarian. That's found in in verse 11 here in chapter 3. R.C. Lucas writes that now Paul can take the characteristic titles of Israel, the chosen, holy, and beloved people, and boldly give them to the community of Christians in Colossae. And in addressing this fullness, this something extra that they were looking for, uh, Lucas writes, whatever form this search for fullness took, there could not fail to be within it, perhaps hardly realized or acknowledged, an implicit criticism of the credentials of the local congregation of believers. That is, in seeking more, they were really denigrating what was present in that local congregation. Here surely lies the reason why the apostle takes pains to name the local church with all its faults as a true representative of the new creation and the new Israel. And if Paul is right, there cannot be any more privileged group to join. Draw from it is not to find something richer and better, but to cut oneself off from the fellowship of God's own people. You're trading down if you're looking for that. So how can he get them to realize this, accept it, and buy into it, to take ownership of being God's elect people? Again, without this translating into this arrogant sense of privilege and position, into being selfish, spoiled, and and sanctimonious. So what he wants them to do, what I, I think by extension he wants us to do, is accept our holiness without haughtiness. To accept sanctification or being made holy without self-righteousness. To buy into the fact that we have been elected of God, but not for the purpose of creating some kind of elitism. Uh, We're chosen, uh, but we're not to be caustic, not to be condemnatory, not to be condescending. So how do you convince a chosen, holy, beloved people to put on a heart of compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience? Not easy for them, not easy for us. Uh, But I think some things that contribute to that uh, proper understanding are the things we're going to notice in the next few minutes. First of all, focusing on the fact that they were chosen by God, not by merit of their own. Uh, And so without getting into a detailed theological discussion of the biblical doctrine of election and how Calvinistic views on the subject differ from Arminian views on the subject and all the shades of variation in between, Let me just jump to the bottom line, which is that our humility as God's chosen people is derived from a realization of who it is who does the choosing. Who it is who does the choosing. Now, it is my belief, and probably some of the belief of uh, yours as well, that based on our understanding of how this works, in this tension, in this symbiotic relationship between the divine will and our own will, in this thing called salvation, that yes, we do have a role in choosing to be chosen. Yes, we do have a role in electing to be elected. But still, God's the one who chooses. God's the one who elects. He's the one who picks. He's the one who selects. His role is that of the initiator. And so that keeps the sovereignty in the relationship where it belongs. It's about His will and His intention and His desire. We are the chosen. He is the chooser. We are the elected. He is the elector. And that should help keep things in proper perspective. Should keep us from getting too big for our britches, spiritually speaking. When we realize that God is the initiator in this, His concerns are dominant, His will is supreme, His agenda has priority, and not my own selfish one. Um, Think about who historically God has chosen, going back to Israel. Deuteronomy 7, you're a holy people, to the Lord your God, so you ought to be puffed up and arrogant and think you're better than everybody else? No. 
You're a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for His own possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, the Lord did not set His love on you or choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples. For you are the fewest of all the peoples. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which He swore to your forefathers, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of, of slavery, from the hand of the king of Pharaoh. You're His chosen ones because He's a God of love. You're His chosen ones because He is a God who keeps His promises. If you look at James chapter 2, verse 5, we'll be able to talk about this text a little more on Life Group Sunday in November when we get to the first part of James chapter 2. But God's chosen the poor, historically, over against the rich. I, I love how Eugene Peterson translates uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 28. Take a good look, friends, at who you were when you got called into this life. I don't see many of the brightest and best among you, not many influential, not many from high society families. Isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that the culture overlooks and exploits and abuses, chose these nobodies to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies? That makes it quite clear that none of you can get by by blowing your own horn before God. Everything that we have, right thinking and right living, a clean slate and a fresh start, comes from God by way of Jesus Christ. That's why we have the saying, if you're going to blow a horn, blow a trumpet for God. That kind of puts things in perspective, doesn't it? Sort of grounds us, sort of humbles us, us humans who are so prone to pride. Us humans who, who are so prone to take credit for things, sometimes when we have minimal input into them, sometimes we have, when we have none at all, we find some way to, to take pride in that. R.T. France writes that God has assured them in Christ that their membership in His people, their being set apart for His service, depends not on their goodness, but on His grace, not on their lovableness, but on His love. So part of this humility that comes from being chosen of God is to remember that we have been chosen of God. Not of our doing, but of His doing. And we have been chosen by God in Christ. And if those phrases look familiar to you that we've already looked at, it's because Jesus is the chosen one. Jesus is the holy one. Jesus is the beloved one of God. Isaiah 42, uh, in regard to the Messiah, this, this is my servant. My chosen one, in whom my soul delights. Uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration, according to Luke's text, the voice from heaven speaks and says, This is my son, my chosen one. You listen to him. First Peter, he is the chosen stone, the choice stone that's been rejected by the builders. He's the holy one. In, in John chapter 6, um, Jesus has gotten pretty tough with some teaching and some people stop being disciples. They just walk away. They don't follow with him anymore. And so Jesus turns to those closest to him and says, you going away too? And Peter answers for them and he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. We've come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. That's how the demons always address him. We know who you are, the Holy One of God. Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2, quoting from the Psalms, God didn't allow his Holy One to undergo decay. And then the beloved one, obviously, again, in his baptism, the voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son. And so our status as God's chosen, holy, and beloved ones, Colossians chapter 3, is only true because we are in his chosen, holy, and beloved one. It's his status confirmed upon us, and that helps keep us humble. You know, it's through him that we have this access, that we have this status. Have you ever been somewhere that you had no business being and could have gotten in a lot of trouble being there except for the person that you were accompanying, the person you were with? You know, and, and so with them, you got in there. So when you got those cockeyed looks and when you got those suspicious stares asking, who are you and what are you doing here? Your immediate response is, I'm with him. I'm with her. That's why I'm here. That's what makes it okay. The only reason that we're chosen and holy and beloved is because we're with him. R.C. Lucas again, once again, we owe to the apostle a real liberation. This time from those overstrained demands for a community that looks more like an outpost of heaven on earth as we think it ought to be. 
And we can at last humble ourselves to recognize that the treasure of Christ's spirit resides in the very ordinary clay of the local congregation of people in Colossae as elsewhere. Once again, we learn from him that it's in Christ and through him alone that we're already qualified to share in the communion and fellowship of the saints. So we're chosen by God, we're chosen by God in Christ, and we're chosen not for perks and privileges. We're chosen for service and sacrifice. Sound familiar? It's because God's chosen holy beloved one came to do the same thing. Not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. William Hendrickson says, we've not only been, we've not just been elected unto salvation, we've been elected unto service. So it's not about status, it's about service. Yeah, we've been chosen, but we've been chosen to wash one another's feet. We've been chosen to consider one another as being more important than ourselves. We've been chosen uh, to bear one another's burdens. And at times, it means we've been chosen to suffer, to suffer for Him. Uh, Beyond the baseline amount of suffering that is going to affect you just because you're a part of the human race, just because you live in the flesh. Uh, all kinds of suffering afflicts us. But sometimes for being a, a disciple of Jesus, there's additional suffering that comes. Uh, if you're a fan of Fiddler on the Roof, uh, I think Tevye understood that element of suffering that comes along with being chosen. In one of my favorite quotes out of, out of many from that play in that movie, Uh, Tevye speaking to the Lord says, I know, I know, Lord, we're your chosen people, but once in a while, couldn't you choose somebody else? Um, You know, he'd had a little too much of being chosen. Being chosen was hard. Being chosen meant suffering, and and he was kind of wanting to make sure God spread spread the wealth a little bit there. And that's precisely another reason that keeps us humble, humble in regard to our election in Christ, and that's because we have been chosen so that others can be chosen. In regard to their status, David Garland writes that this theological viewpoint can be dangerous if it leads to a false sense of privilege that would shut the door on outsiders rather than flinging wide the gates. Uh, Shutting the door on outsiders is how elite organizations among the kingdoms of men thrive and keep their exclusive status. Uh, They set the parameters narrowly so that as few people as possible are admitted into the community, whether that's a social community, whether that's an academic community, whether that's an athletic community, they they strain the limits of exclusion. And the operative questions are how many people can we keep out? How few people can we allow in? That's what keeps the club exclusive. You limit access. That's what the Pharisees did according to Jesus in Matthew 23, 14. They weren't entering the kingdom of God, but they were standing in the door to keep others from going in. But it works differently in the kingdom of God. The mission of His chosen ones is to intentionally, actively, and aggressively expand their ranks to include everyone who chooses to be chosen. Uh, The potential membership list is pretty hefty because it says that God desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. He's not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. That keeps us from becoming exclusivists. That keeps us from becoming elitists when we realize that God wants, whether they're willing to be chosen, we don't know. But God wants everybody to be chosen. We've been chosen to bless others. Again, when when you see what he says to the chosen, holy, and beloved ones, what follows in Colossians 3.12 is not about perks and privileges. It's about things that offer grace and blessing to other people. Compassion, kindness, humility gentleness, patience. Doesn't do a whole lot for me, but it sure does a lot for other people. And those things in your life don't do a whole lot for you, but they sure bless me. When you're compassionate toward me, and you're kind toward me, and you're humble toward me, and you're gentle toward me, and you're patient with me. Um, We don't have time to read the rest of the text, but he goes on to talk about bearing with one another. You can literally translate that enduring one another putting up with one another. Sometimes being a Christian is a barrel of laughs. You know, it's just fun to be together. Sometimes it's a beating, you know. Do you mind if I say that? (laughs) Sometimes it's a beating because we wear one another out. We irritate one another. We get on one another's nerves. 
And so how do we respond? We bear with one another. We endure one another. We put up with one another. You know? And I hope that you'll put up with me, you know, when you need to put up with me. Uh, forgiving one another. He assumes that they're going to sin against one another. They're going to wrong one another. They're going to hurt one another. They're going to disappoint one another. It's a presupposition. So he says, you're going to need to forgive one another. You're going to need it in the giving. You're going to need it in, in the receiving. Um, Robert Wall here, holiness is not exclusively defined by acts of private devotion. Rather, it pertains to public occasions when the community can express its status as God's chosen people through concrete responses to those who were last, least, lost, and lame among us. For Paul, our personal salvation is always embodied in public relationships. It's what Charles Wesley called social holiness. Sometimes we think holiness is about this private piety, just this condition of the heart that's hidden from everybody. No, holiness is, is social. And then finally, in this regard, we, we've been chosen as ambassadors. We represent him. And that's humbling. Because whether I'm going to school tomorrow, whether I'm going to work tomorrow, whether I'm going to give blood after Bible class, or whether I'm coming to the fall festival, I'm there as a representative, as an ambassador, as a delegate, as a diplomat, if you will, for the kingdom of God. And what this world thinks about God largely depends on us. Because they haven't seen him face to face, but they, they meet his ambassadors all the time. Uh, I love these three quotes real quickly. F.F. F. Bruce, it remains true that the reputation of the gospel is bound up with the behavior of those who claim to have experienced its saving power. People who do not read the Bible for themselves or listen to the preaching of the word of God can see the lives of those who do and can form their judgment accordingly. Again from Wall. Uh, since we authenticate God's salvation by our lives and words, we can either impugn or enhance God's reputation by bad or good example. What kind of reputation does God have among your friends and co-workers as a result of your example day by day? And finally, something I shared on Facebook yesterday from Hendrickson. It was, it was then as it is now. In the long run, the reputation of the gospel depends on its devotees. So... How do we really accomplish this? I love the practical advice in the next chapter, chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you'll know how you should respond to each person. As a representative of Christ, as a diplomat of, of the kingdom of God. One final quote. Paul's words imply that believers are to be cautious, and tactful so as to avoid needlessly antagonizing and alienating their pagan neighbors. In a positive sense, they also imply that believers should conduct themselves so that the way they live will attract, impress, and convict non-Christians and give the pagan community a favorable impression of the gospel. And it's, it's challenging to me to consider how well am I doing that through personal relationships with other people, through presence in social media, how am I doing that? What does my culture know of God as a result of my tone and my temperament in regard to the words that I choose, the words that I choose to write, the words that I choose to speak? Do they hear voices that are constantly shrill and indignant and arrogant and vitriolic and uncivil and condescending and snarky and snippy and sarcastic? Do they perceive petty partisanship? Do they perceive the politicization of faith? If they do, how unwise of me. How ungracious of me. How unchosen of me. If that's what people think about God because of my example. So the text, one final time, verses 12 through 15. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved... Put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. If the only thing that existed in the New Testament after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was these four verses, I'd have plenty to work on for the rest of my life. 
if that's all the New Testament was. Just that is enough to humble me, challenge me, shame me, and keep me busy for the rest of my life. I just hope it keeps me busy tomorrow. I just hope it keeps me busy this afternoon. That we can live as chosen, holy, and beloved people. If you're still living as a child of disobedience and want to choose to be chosen, want to elect to be elected, uh, then we urge you to do that. Confess Jesus, be united with Him in baptism, begin walking in His steps, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, if you need prayers for strength, encouragement, whatever your need may be, our shepherds will be up here to assist you uh, while Brennan leads us in this song. Let's stand together.